If you have your copy of God's Word, go ahead and turn to Psalm 32. Psalm 32, we're going to talk about joy this morning. And you'll look at the psalm and wonder, what in the world, where did he get this from? Well, it's pretty basic. You'll figure it out as we get going. Uh, But Psalm 32, and if you would, in honor of reading God's Word, would you stand with me? All right, I'm going to stay on the floor just for a little bit to have some fun with you, just to do something different. Because I know how much you love doing things different, right? All right, Psalm 32, Psalm of David, which I don't know for me, I don't know how it is for you. They just always seem to, I really love the Psalms of David. They resonate with my spirit so much. Uh, And David writes, he said, How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with a fever heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they will not teach him. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in a way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be as a horse or as a mule, which have no understanding, whose trappings include a bit and a bridle to hold them in check. Otherwise, they will not come near to you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for David's testimony here as he speaks to us through the psalm. And Father, we pray that as we spend some time in your word today, you will speak to us and allow us as your people to hear your word and apply it to our lives, that we hear it in our heart language, Father, in a way that maybe we haven't heard it before, that today is the day that you speak and transform and change us. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. A lot of people in our world are looking for joy. Sometimes we get joy confused with happiness, don't we? I mean, we like being happy. There's nothing wrong with being happy. But happiness comes and goes, doesn't it? You don't believe me? Watch small children, right? Those of you as parents, or you have, it's different when you're the grandparent, I think, because they're on a little better behavior, I think, with the grandparents for a little bit because they get their way all the time, right? That's a joke, right? You know how that works. But there's just something, one time, you know, a child can be going wonderful, everything's going, and then something happens, and their world is destroyed, right? You know what I'm talking about. And what's really interesting is adults, we still do that too, don't we? Different circumstances may cause that for us, and we let that happiness fade. But what we're not talking about this morning, we're not talking about happiness. We're talking about joy and, and what that means to us and what, what uh, David tries to describe as joy and why we should be joyful and why if anyone that is alive on planet earth, followers of Jesus Christ should be joyful. Joy should permeate our lives. It should be expressed because of what God has done in us, the work that he's accomplished. And we're going to look at that in this great psalm that David writes in in a variety of ways. And I'll just be kind of going back through the psalm again, kind of through the verses and some different things. But he starts it off with verse one is how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. Being forgiven is a good thing. Feels good, doesn't it? How many remember when you were a small child and you did something you were not supposed to and you thought you weren't going to get caught, right? But as, as my mother used to tell me, she had eyes in the back of her head and there was a time I believed her. And my father used to say, we know everybody in this town and they'll tell me if you did something wrong. And in those days, that pretty much worked. I, it was evident, you know, I, you know, it was one thing, I could do something out in public and I thought I got away with it and then it got back home. But when you're, when you're under, you know, you know you've done something wrong and you're kind of like, I, I don't want to tell on myself, I don't want to confess it, I'm just going to kind of keep it to myself and I'm going to kind of just go with it and see what happens. It causes issues in your life, doesn't it? There's that little thing called guilt. Anybody know what it's about? You know, and it kind of comes up and you realize, you know, I've done this wrong. I I know I need to make it right or I know I need to apologize, repent, whatever I need to do. But I I just, I I don't want to do it right now. I don't have time to do that. I don't want to do that because it's it's not going to be easy. 
And yet there's just something about holding sin in and trying to, you know, justify it in our minds, thinking, you know, no matter what it is, we say, well, I'm not that wrong. Somebody, you know, I love how we justify ourselves by what other people did to us or when somebody else does it. And when we justify ourselves, we always compare ourselves to the worst person we can imagine, right? Like, you know, well, I'm not as bad as this person on, on death row, or I'm not as bad as Adolf Hitler. Okay, that's probably a good, yeah. But you know who God compares us to? Jesus. You can't win there, folks. I'm just going to tell you, from personal experience, there is no way that I can compare to Jesus and his righteousness and who he is and all the goodness that he is. When God compares me to him, I fall woefully short. I can't even describe how far short I fall from him. It's not, I mean, there's such a thing as being in the same ballpark. I'm not even in the same universe. I mean, it's not even close. I have greatly fallen from where I should be. And that's, that's distressing. But did you, did you hear where David was going here? When your sin is forgiven, when the consequences of your sin, not just the consequences, but the judgment of your sin is taken away, that's a good feeling. It's kind of like when you're delivered from uh, something you've done as a child and you think, well, I, I know I shouldn't have done that, and you, you get a free pass. You know you deserve in those days. I don't know if your parents spanked you. Mine did. So just if they didn't, I'm sorry. Yeah. You know where that's going. But I, you know, as I always say, I, I never got a whooping I didn't deserve. And there were a lot of times I deserved a whooping I didn't get one. But I'm grateful for the, for the, for the mercy and also the, the discipline of my parents. Not, I can be more now than I, I can honestly say at the time I was not very grateful. And yes, I have heard my parents say this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. And I remember telling my dad, you're lying to me, dad. <laughs> that is not true. This is really going to hurt and I know it. But when I became a father... I understood what my father was saying. It made a whole lot more sense to me when I had to discipline my children. And I think that that's part of the rub we have with God sometimes. We think that, you know, God just enjoys harming us, and he does not. God desires what is best for us. He desires that we become the men and women of God that he has created us to be. The potential that he sees in us. You know, when the kids were singing up here a while ago, you know, they probably didn't get every note right. And that's okay, isn't it? That's perfectly fine. Because you know what? They weren't singing to us anyway. Did you get that? It wasn't for us. We, were get, we got to kind of eavesdrop on their opportunity to worship God. And they, they were singing to him, and that's, that's beautiful. That's, one, that's what it's all about. And when you sing in worship, that's who you're singing to. You're not singing to me or the people in front of you or to the worship leader. You're singing to God Almighty, and he's the one who hears you. He's the one who's, who listens to your voice, and he's the one who treasures those words that come from your heart. And I love the heart of David. Although David had his share of flaws, we know, okay, they're documented. David made a lot of mistakes. He did a lot of stupid stuff. I don't know any other way to describe it. And he would agree with me if you're here today. He knows. He made the mistakes. But he also understood the mercy of God and the forgiveness of God. And that's what he's talking about here. Of course, Psalm 32 is probably much earlier than before his issues with Bathsheba. But he's understood forgiveness. And I love this. He loves in verse 2, he says, How blessed is a man whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. The purity that God allows to take place in us through the work of Jesus Christ enables us to be people in whom there is no guile. There is no deceit. There is no wickedness because of what Christ Jesus has accomplished in us. How he has changed us. And even though this is before the time of Christ, I can't help but think that David is alluding to the forgiveness and mercy that comes from Christ. He goes down at verse 3 and 4. We're going to camp there for a minute because I think there's something... It says, when I, it says, when I keep silent about my sin, when I hold it in, my body wastes away and my groaning, through my groaning all day long, for day and night your hand is heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with a fever in, that, in the heat of summer. It's like, you know, when you've got the guilt and you know you're wrong and you don't want to confess, but you know you're wrong. Anybody ever been there? Don't raise your hands. It reminds me of a book, a short story written by a guy named Edgar Allan Poe. And since we're around that time of the year, we can talk about Poe, right? Well, he grew up in Baltimore, right? Not, or not, he lived in Baltimore. I don't know if he grew up there. That's where he lived, where he died. Wrote a story, and many of us had to read it in his children. Remember the Telltale Heart? Anybody remember that short story? Yeah. Kind of gruesome. It, yeah, that's right. He had his issues. We know Poe had his issues. 
But he describes guilt and the power of guilt quite well in that short story, doesn't it? I mean, the guy has committed this heinous crime and he thinks he's gotten away with it. And they're right there and he's, it's like the guy, I think he buried him under the boards of the house or something like that. You know, that's pretty gross. But anyway, you think, why is the pastor talking about that? It's Sunday. You'll understand when I get there. But in this, this, the guilt consumes him and overwhelms him. What happens? You remember in the short story, what does he do? He, th- he confesses. The guilt overwhelms him. And sometimes for us, it's like that, isn't it? We, are, we know we're guilty. We know we've done wrong. And, and we, we, we think we've hidden it pretty well. And we've kind of, no, nobody really knows but us. But then the guilt comes and we can't let go. And the guilt overwhelms us. And we want mercy, we want forgiveness, but we, we have to get it out. And the beauty of what David is telling us here is that this guilt that comes, this, this judgment that is coming in our lives, there is an answer for it. It's not a self-help book. It's not just talking about it. And he goes in the next verse and he talks about it. He says, I acknowledge my sin to you. My iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. I believe it's in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And not just forgive us, what does he do? He cleanses us of all unrighteousness. I think we forget that second half of that verse all too often about what God does in us. I'm going to quiz you like I did first service and see if you do any better. In this text, it goes on and he describes... uh, It kind of goes down a little bit, so I'm I'm giving you the quiz a little early so you can think about it. He talks about his righteous ones in verse 11, okay? Are you one of his righteous ones this morning? What do you think? How many of you think you're one of the righteous ones? Anybody? Oh, boy. You need to listen to the rest of this message. I'm going to tell you who the righteous ones are. Because, and it's not about what, what I believe, what I, it's what I know to be true. It's the reality of what Scripture teaches. Because when David talks about seeking God's forgiveness and seeking God's mercy, he understands that God is the one that does the work and changes him. Verse 6 is a clue to this. He says, Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely, in a flood of great waters, they will not reach him, he says. And then verse 7. You know, Every once in a while, when you're reading the Bible, a verse jumps off the page, doesn't it? It either smacks you between the eyes or grabs your heart. And it holds you there. Because it's a verse that, it's the, that's the beauty of the Word of God, isn't it? You may have read it a thousand times, but in that moment, it touches you in a way it never has before. That's because it's the word of God. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, the spirit of God indwells you and the spirit of God speaks to you. The Holy Spirit brings that to you and he shows you things you couldn't see before. And suddenly it comes where, and that's for me, when as I read this text again, preparing this message, seven just jumps out. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. And many years ago, a woman named Corrie Ten Boom, I believe, was one who wrote the book, The Hiding Place. Many of you may have seen the dramatization of The Hiding Place and know the story about this, her family that hid Jews from the Nazis in a, basically almost like a closet room in their house. They had created this room with a false wall and they would hide them in there when the Nazis would come by. Oh, there's nobody here. And they hid several and saved the lives of several Jewish families as a result of that. And eventually, unfortunately, were caught. But I think of that hiding place and how secure that place seemed to be. But the, what What David's describing here is a a different kind of hiding place than in your house. You know, we may call it a panic room or whatever, but it's a hiding place where God is the one hiding you. Where the creator of the universe, the almighty one, is the one who is your hiding place. He is the one protecting you. He is the one shielding you from the enemy. He is the one who is around you. And you are safe and secure because of who holds you and who encompasses you. And as I thought of that text, I think this speaks volumes to our walk with Christ and sometimes something we forget so easily about our salvation is how that God is the one that holds us. God is the one that protects us. God is the one that keeps us saved. And I have this discussion with my Pentecostal friends every now and then. You know, they 
love to believe in losing salvation, and that's great, you know, and they show me scriptures, and I'm like, I show you scriptures, so what are we doing here? But the reality of it is, is that if, if my salvation is based in what I can accomplish and what I can do, then I can lose it. No question. I can lose it. But if it's based on what God has done and what God has accomplished, you think I can take myself out of the hand of God? Can I overcome the Almighty One, the creator of the universe, and say, God, I don't want to be a part of this anymore. I'm done. And he says, okay. Now, we can get into a lot of theological issues and have a lot of fun discussing this. We're not going to do that this morning. Sorry. I know that's what some of you want to do. But the beauty of that is, the power of that is, is that it's God that holds us. God that keeps us. We are saved by grace through faith, as Paul says. Not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that you can, talk, can brag about it. It's all about what he does. And, and the psalmist here, David here, he even captures a measure of this with this idea of the hiding place. This, and, and in this, you, I love this. I'm in this hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. What are those songs that when you hear them, whether they're a hymn or a new song that's come out, a praise and worship song, what are those songs that when you hear them, it reaches into your soul and reminds you of the deliverance that God has done in your life? You have those songs? You know, I don't know what that song is for you, and it's different for each and every one of us. There's just something about certain, certain songs that touch us beyond here and down into here with who we are. And that's what he's talking about. These are the songs of deliverance that encompass you, that surround you, that remind you who God is. And David was a guy that kind of, he liked music a little bit. Would you agree with that? He was a musician. He had talents and gifts. And he, there's something about music we see. And many of the songs that we sing, I know a lot of people like, I love how people like to complain about, you know, some of the contemporary worship. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meddle here. Is that okay? And they talk about these new songs that people write. And a lot of these new songs are just psalms that people have put to contemporary music. And you know how old those psalms are? They're older than the hymns. Yes, they are. Because they're written by who? And also David and other authors of psalms written before the coming of Christ. And have been retooled to remind us of the great truths of Scripture. And I think about those, whatever that song is that God speaks to you, and it may be a hymn. I, you know, there's hymns, there's, there's some old hymns that just really resonate with my spirit. And when I hear them, it just reminds me of so much, and it speaks to me. And there's some of the contemporary worship songs that do the same for me, I've noticed nowadays. They do that, and that's okay. That's, it's not the point of what the song is. The point is here that God is speaking to you and reminding you that you are safe and in his presence. He's the one holding you, as, as David says here. He's the one who's given you this hiding place. And then he goes and changes perspectives here in verse 8. It talks about the perspective of God. I will instruct you and teach you the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose trappings include a bit and bridle, and hold them in check. Otherwise, they will not come near to you. Now, I don't know how many of you have been around mules before. You know what a mule is? You know what a mule is good for? Yeah, and if you can get a mule to do what you want it to do, it makes a horse look like a wimp. But if a mule does not want to do what you want it to do, do you think it's going to change? There's a reason why we have that expression, stubborn as a mule, right? And coming from Missouri, which that's our state animal, and I know why, I'm going to leave that alone. I could go off on my state in a lot of ways on that one. Uh, and I've been, around, I've been around a few mules, and it's just an interesting, they're just an interesting animal, okay? And you may think that it's going to go, and you may pull it all you want, but when that mule kind of gets in that position where it's not going, it's, it's going to take five or six guys a lot bigger than me to even begin to move that animal. It's not going. And what's interesting is that so many of us at times are like that mule in our walk with God, aren't we? God is trying to move us. God is trying to lead us. God says, I want you to go here. And we're like, no way. Not digging. Not going. I'm afraid. Can't see where we're going. No, I don't like it. No, I'm staying right here. God, I'm not going to go where you lead me. I'm not going to do what you want to do. No, I am right here. I am just, I'm going to stick it out. I'm going to be stubborn. And he says, don't be like that. That's foolish. And think about it. When we try to tell God that we know better, how dumb is that? That's pretty dumb. What part of all knowing about God do we not understand? God knows what is best. 
He knows everything about our lives. He knows what is best for us as people. He knows what's best for us as a church. He knows what's best for you and your family. He knows that. But a lot of times we think, well, God, I, I know what your plan is. I know what you told me to do. But I, 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 God, I think I got a better way. Really? And yet we do that. And I can only speak from personal experience because I do that with God. It's funny that the conversations that, that God and I have together and he, you know, He's not patronizing with me, but sometimes he just has to, you know, I, I, I know he's laughing. He's got to be. Because sometimes I'm just stupid, okay? And so are you, right? If you rebel against God, that's kind of stupid, isn't it? I mean, it, it, think about it. He knows what to do with your life. He knows what's best for you. He sees your life from beginning to end and beyond. He knew you before you were you. And you're going to tell him, God, I think I know a better way. I think I've got a better plan, God. I think, I think I can figure this out better than you can. I mean, it's my life, God. I, I know. And yet we do that so often anyway. I've kind of beat that mule horse. Well, mule. Let's try it that way. It wasn't a horse. To death here. Let's go on in the text here and kind of, we're getting near the end. I know that encourages some people because that means lunch is around the corner. All right. And uh, come on. There we go. It's coming. Takes it a while sometimes. But this idea of, of stubbornness that comes from our spirit, that, you know, with a mule or an animal, you have to move it. You, you know, with a horse, you have a bridle, right? I can't imagine that's a very comfortable thing for a horse to wear. What do you think? Can you imagine sticking a piece of metal in your mouth? And yet that controls it. And we do that to do, for, for that for that purpose. And yet he says we have to do all these things for animal, but you are not like that. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. I want, to, I want you to think about that. I know a lot of times we look at the Bible and we read it, and we read the Bible like we read a book to get it done. But I really want to spend a, spend a little bit of time on the end of verse 10, the, first, the second half. He who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. Now, the word that is used there in the Hebrew is hesed, which is the same word that's used for mercy. And it's God's mercy. It's abundant mercy. It's loving kindness. And the idea of that mercy, imagine being surrounded and encompassed by something that the, the little air that you are in literally drips from it. It's so overwhelming. I mean, it's just everywhere. And that's what he's describing here. The mercy of God has surrounded you. It has encompassed you. You are overwhelmed. You are just completely saturated with God's mercy. Can you think of a better place to be? that God's mercy has just completely engulfed you. You are ever-present in God. Wherever you are with God, He has shown you such incredible mercy. He has demonstrated His love to you in such a way that you are forgiven. You are no longer just a person or a, a member of a church. You're now a child of God. You're a member of God's family. Yes, Jesus is your brother now. That, that's what happens in the transforming relationship. That's what it takes place when the gospel comes into our life and we repent and give our lives to Christ we now become a member of God's family and it is a completely different relationship than any other relationship we have been. And we are saturated with God's mercy. It surrounds us. And David is describing that before he even knows it. He just knows, I can't wait. Just imagine when you trust in the Lord, you are, you are surrounded by mercy. You're overwhelmed by mercy. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones. Who are the righteous ones? Are you a righteous one? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, absolutely, you're a righteous one. And how righteous are you on a scale of one to a hundred? You've had, I've told you this before, hopefully you remember. I'm going to see if you were listening a few months ago when I told you this. How righteous are you on a scale of one to a hundred if you're a Christian? 100%. Because it is not your righteousness that God sees. It is Christ's righteousness. How righteous is our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ? Duh. That's an easy question. He is completely righteous. He is 100% beyond. He is righteous. He is holy. He is God. That same righteousness envelops you and I as followers of Jesus Christ. It literally clothes us. It's described by Paul as he describes it in another text. I don't know what that does for you, but that kind of overwhelms me a little bit. To think that when I stand in the presence of God before in judgment, that God is not going to see Mike God is going to see Jesus. Hallelujah. I don't know what you've done, but I know what I've done. 
I know how far I have strayed from God. I know the things in the rebellion that I have, have done. I know what I deserve. I'm well aware of that, but I'm also even more aware of what God has done for me, and I am so grateful that he has shown, chosen to show me mercy. He has chosen to allow Christ to stand in my place, not just at the cross, but at judgment. And there is a judgment of saints you know, and sinners. It's in the scriptures. There will be a day of judgment. There will we stand before the judge. And there'll be a lot of people that stand before him in judgment, and they'll try and stand in their own strength. And that's not good. That will not work. Because the standard isn't somebody else. The standard is Jesus, and there's no way I can live up to that standard. Lest that standard is now, I love the word used, in, I think it's in the King James, imputed unto me. God puts his righteousness, the son's righteousness on me. And I literally wear it in my, in, like, almost like a, like a cloak. Does that not excite anybody else? Does that not bring us joy to know that no matter what happens in this life, because of what Christ has done in us, we will be able to stand before God in the secure security of knowing that we are God's child, not because of what we have or haven't done, but because what of Christ has done for us. It's because of Jesus. That should bring us joy. But for a lot of us in the church of Jesus Christ, there's not a lot of joy, is there? I had an evangelist used to work with him in my, in my last church I served, and he was a great guy. I'd known him for years before that. And he used to say this a lot when he'd get folks up there and He'd say, are you happy in the Lord? Do you sense God's joy in your life? And, you know, people, people would have said, yeah, right? That's what we do, yeah. he said, well, notify your face, please. And that's not original with him, but I, I mean, that's the reality. People can't tell, can they? They don't know. We don't exude that. I think if, we're, if we have been delivered from the consequences of sin, which is not just physical death, it is eternal death and separation from God. We have been delivered and set free from that. We are now righteous ones in the eyes of God. We ought to shout for all joy. We ought to be excited about that. We should celebrate that. We should understand, hey, I'm a child of the king. Now, I'm not telling you walk around and strut and, and show off. That's not what I'm saying. But understand who you are in Christ Jesus. What has he done in your life if you're his, kid, his, his child? He has made you his child. Your eternity is set because of what Christ has done. Always comes back to that. You know, if I, if I really were honest to how about little my salvation has to do with me, it's kind of scary. But it's kind of way, it's kind of good because if there was a lot to do with me, I'd find a way to mess it up. How about you? I'm good at messing things up. I'm good at creating a mess. I'm good at taking something good and, and, and making it something that it's not supposed to be. We're, we're all good at that. But it's not dependent upon our goodness. It's dependent upon the goodness and power and grace of the Almighty God. And that should bring us true joy. The security of knowing that as followers of Jesus Christ, we are in the hands of the Almighty. And because of his mercy, as he says, no one will snatch them out of my hand. They are mine. Think you can win? Think somebody's gonna? You think Satan's gonna win an arm wrestling match with God and gonna take us away? Is that what you think's gonna happen? Really? Think there's much of a chance of that happening? You know how much chance of that is that is happening? There's a better chance, a much better chance, an infinitely better chance that I'm gonna get a call from the Kansas City Chiefs today and come be their quarterback. That's a better chance that that would happen. That Satan has any prayer against God. And you know how you know how realistic that chance is. And I say Chiefs, but those of you that know me know that's I'm a fan of the Chiefs. I grew up in that part of the country. But you know how realistic, I, I couldn't even make my high school team, and my high school team stunk. So anyway, I'm just telling you, there's pretty much a zero below zero chance that that's going to happen today. That's not going to happen. Not getting a call from the coach. And there's no way on earth or in the universe that Satan is going to wrestle you or me from the hand of Almighty God who loves us. We are his. He has purchased us. We are bought with the blood, the precious, amazing blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And David is seen into the future in this as he approaches the song. I mean, he's seen these things. He's experiencing God's mercy in his own life, but he doesn't even realize what's coming.
But he, you know, David knew how to get excited. Would you agree with me? He knew how to praise God. He knew how to, to go there. I wonder what it's going to be like in heaven when he's leading worship. So that's what he's doing. I mean, you know he's a worship leader. I mean, he, he played that whatever, lyre, harp thing, whatever it is. I don't know. Something, I don't know. It's some kind of goofy string instrument. But I mean, they probably have an electric one up there now. I don't know what he'll have. It'd be pretty cool. And they'll probably have a whole praise band behind him. I mean, I have no idea who'll be in that one. It'd probably be, you have to sign up years in advance. I mean, there's going to be some time. And it's going to be great. And he's going to, and all it's about, it's not about, it's not about, it's all about praising his God because that's what his life was about. And that's what our life should be about. Everything we do in this life is about praising the one who saved us and just saying, thank you. Thank you for saving me, Lord. What can I do to honor you with my life? See, we don't serve God out of guilt. We don't serve God to earn his favor or to earn our salvation. That doesn't work that way. That doesn't work in the economy of God. It is impossible. We serve God to express our gratitude and joy for what he has done in our lives. It's, it's a thank offering to him. Thank you, God, for what you've done. So as you have opportunities to serve him, that's what you're doing. You're thanking God and expressing the joy that he has placed in you to others and demonstrating for them what God has done and celebrating that. And isn't that what our lives as followers of Christ should be about? Celebrating who Jesus is and what he's accomplished. Shout for all joy, all of you who are upright in heart. Pray with me. Father, thank you for your words. I thank you for the word of David and how you spoke through him and used him in so many ways. And like all of us, Father, he had, he had issues. He had flaws and character and things he didn't do well. I can relate so well. But Father, his heart was where you wanted it to be. And he understood that it was all about what you had done and what you had accomplished in his life. And I pray, Father, if there is one here today that has not come to experience that life-altering and life-transforming relationship that comes through knowing Jesus Christ, I pray that today would be the day that they let go of the excuses, step across that line of faith and say, God, I want to do what you want to do with my life. And if there's another one, if some of us here today, Father, and we just know that today's the day we need to say, Father, I am tired of trying to do it all myself. I'm tired of robbing myself of joy and trying to earn my way to heaven or earn whatever it is, earn favor from you, Father, to understand you have accomplished everything for me and to rest in that. I pray that, Father, you would accomplish that. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.